So let me, since we have a long, only an hour for a long webinar, so let me start a little bit. Uh, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you guys are. Welcome to the GMI webinar, uh, De-Energize to Trip versus Energize to Activate. The name is a program in itself, you know. <laughs> Before okay. we start, let me advise you that uh, we have collected your question during the registration process and we'll be answering them at the end of the webinar. Uh, throughout the webinar, you can post for the question using the chat feature uh, and we will try to get to them uh, as we move along. I will keep up look for it and uh, we'll see when we can get to them. Um, before we start, let me introduce Tino. Maybe we go to the next slide, Tino. Okay. Tino is our speaker today. He has too many years of experience uh, to mention in the process industry and more specifically in the functional safety. He's a senior functional safety expert and trainer under the TUV Rhino SIS program. He's been providing training, social safety training, and sharing knowledge through article publication for as long as I've known you, Tino. Not that you're older than me, and eh? we have the same presentation. <laughs> and uh, in a nutshell, he's super qualified to run the webinar today. I need to take myself, I'm Paolo Landrini. I, I am a sales manager of GMI. So before we Began, I need to take a few moments to introduce GMI, who we are, what we do, and why we do it. So, Tino, next slide. Mm -hmm. So, uh, GMI is a safety company. We design, engineer, and manufacture a complete range of intrinsically safe and SEED certified devices, which are used in automation packages such as DCS, CSD, fire and gas, and so on, in all industrial sectors, from oil and gas to mining, food and bath, and so on. We have over 40 years of experience. Very proud to have our production here, 100% internal production in our state-of-the-art facility near Milan. On the other end, we have global players with presence in all the continents. Next slide, Tino, please. I'm here. And uh, so we have our offices in different parts of the world, Dubai, uh, USA, Shanghai, and so on. We have many local distributors. We have about 200 super dedicated employees. And we run... Webinar seminar in functional safety NEX. Tino is our trainer. And we make safety products. So we try to make them as good as possible because at the end, our components provide for the safety and the availability of the plant they're installed in. So we use state of the art technologies, we trace 100% of our product. Uh, we test them 100%. We have a very highly automated manufacturing process. We offer five years warranty and 10 years guarantee availability. And of course, this product is certified globally. That will be next slide, you know? Okay. Yes, I remember correctly. <laughs> and uh, we have many, many certification, including functional safety management up to SIL3 by TUV. We also, of course, have ISO 9001 for quality, 45,000 for OSHA, ROI. We have another one now, you know, that is not up here. It's uh, 14,000. Then we have Ross and Reach. And of course, all the certificates that are required to guarantee safety of our product. Uh, we, these are the product we manufacture, IS Barrier up to SEAL-3 certification. We have safety relay, SEAL-3 certified safety relays with and without line monitoring. We also have a line of isolator as well, also SEAL certified, power supply, EX and SEAL certified power supply, and a line of multiplexer, temperature digital art multiplexers, a line of surge protection device, SPDs, some indicators, and of course, uh, lots of termination boards dedicated to the, most of the system out there. And of course, we have the division that runs a training and services in functional safety and EX domain. I guess next slide will be a list of our, some of our customers. So we serve all the system vendors from ABB to Yokogawa. And we operate with many EPC contractors and we're very proud to have a lots of OEM that use our product. 
because our products are very reliable and um, certified up to 70 degrees. So they're installed in really rigs, platforms, uh, and many, many skids in the desert, uh, well at panels and so on. And we are in the AVL of many of most of the oil and gas end users. I believe this is my bit, Tino. Let's see next slide. Yes. So now it is your turn to talk about the energize versus energize. I'll be here in the background. Uh, if you have any questions, let's say there is a chat box. Okay, Tino, up to you. Okay, thank you, Paolo, for the introduction and thank you for GM International for giving us another opportunity to share some of our know-how. Um, as Paolo are saying, if you have a question, there will be a Q&A section that you can find also here on this webinar. So you can post your question. Paolo will monitor that uh, because I will focusing here on the slides itself. This webinar is being recorded as all our previous ones will, will be available on the uh, YouTube channel from GM International. And the slides will also be sent to you in a electronic form, in a PDF form, if I remember well. And correct me if I'm wrong, Paolo, but I think this is still the case that you send yeah, all the very much so. webinars, copies, etc. All right. So the topic for, for today is actually one of the basic principles and also one of the easy topics that is sometimes misunderstood. That's why we're running this webinar, de energize versus Energize. And some of the products that uh, Paolo was just showing, like the safety relays with the line monitoring or without, and also the power supplies are also part here of this webinar because we're going to refer to some of those interfaces that GMI is providing. Basic principles before we start. Um, according to the IEC or the ISA 61511, second edition, every single safety loop description should be describing as much as possible details that the engineer end of the day will know how to first of all design it, to build it, to use it, and to maintain it. So based on the 61511, there are 29 bullets that shall be included and shall describe, and it is the word shall that is in the normative section of the standard. So there is a request from the standard to try to describe all these items in detail. I picked one of the items, one of the 29, which is called energize to activate your functionality, which will be the classical cases for a fire and gas system, like for instance, an application like a sprinkle or deluge system. Whereas the normal classical safety instrumented systems are always in a de-energized to trip fashion. So one is, we call it the zero logics. The other ones are called the one logics, but more will be used here in this webinar. I start with the first one, which is called the de-energize to trip. And yet again, I brought here another abbreviation just for this webinar, for not every type, every time having to type out the entire word. But the de-energize to trip means that the majority of your safety loops, I reckon something between 95 to 98 percent of your entire safety loops today are on the principle of de-energize to trip. We used to call this the, um, the uh, idle current principle. That means that you take the current away, take the power away, and your safety loop is supposed to go to the safe position. So the definition of a trip is to achieve your process into a safe state. That is the condition of a de-energized to trip application. That is also known in the industry for many years as the fail safe principle. Like many, many, many years ago, let's uh, go back to the years uh, 70, 80, when the first fail safe systems were on the market, were later on being called the safety PLC vendors, where they were always talking about a fail safe controller. If the controller internally has a failure, and it is a known failure based on their diagnostic capabilities, then they go to a safe position. So if you think about the fundamentals of the hardware concept here, you remove the power, you remove the energy, you remove your electrical signal or your pneumatic, hydraulic, etc. Your SIF or the safety loop, safety instrument function shall go to the safe state. Common examples of such subsystems that are 
making your system into a safe state are, for instance, the shutdown or the critical shutdown systems, which are in, in the engineering terms, we call that the ESDs or the emergency shutdown systems, which are typically something like we show over here. So the principles of a safety instrument function or a safety loop, I made here a, uh, a collection of pictures. And if you start from the left to the right, we start here with a measurement, a sensor to measure the process value. The process value itself, which is provided here in the instrument, can go here through an isolator. And I took here one of the isolators here from uh, GMI. That means that this signal will be then transferred into the analog input board here from the safety PLC vendor. That's your logic solver. In there, you will actually program the logic saying that if my process value is reaching a certain trip limit, provide the right signal to the field, in other words, make sure that the valve can either go open if it would be a fail to open the valve or can go close if it would be a fail to close valve. To interface with the final elements over here, we are using here an interposing relay and more of these interposing relays will be also uh, used here in this webinar. Enable to remove the power here to that uh, um, solenoid to remove the instrument there here to the actuator of the final element. That is the classical case of a one-to-one. -one. So a de energize would mean that the final element, we want to take the energy away, we want to take the instrument there away to go to the safe state. And I think, Paolo, by memory, there's a first uh, poll question coming up. Yep, here it is. We have a poll for you guys, making sure you're still listening. <laughs> Although okay. we're very early in the webinar. So what is the role of a power supply for instrument or a device in a de-energized to trip application? You have uh, four choices, actually five choices. Is a reliability issue for your SIF or an availability issue for that SIF? Or can be both reliability and availability, or it is irrelevant to the energized to trip application or none of the above. Honestly, it's the first time I see it myself, so I have to give it some thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but you guys have a few moments to answer, you know, just click and we just and then, see and then I will the answer. We don't know who answers, so don't be shy, you know, we will not judge you. We just want to see if you understand the question. So, reliability or availability? Mm -hmm. We're talking about a de energized to trip application. Yeah, to, to which is the tricky. Off. Well, this is a tricky one. It's the power off. And pe people typically take a decision because the power needs to go off. Yeah. So, there is no need in some engineer's mind mm -hmm. for a, let's say, a reliable power supply in terms of a still rated power supply. Because you think, you consider, you, you think, well, if I lose power, I should go to safety. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think... Uh, we are still having some votes coming in. Yeah, yeah, there's still some votes. Uh, whenever you want me to end, uh, I will end it. We have about 60% uh, answer. So guys, just click some numbers here so we can move on. We have <laughs> so, all the answers Yeah, I, 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 you know, the, the issue that I know of, uh, although I'm not 100% sure about the answer, is that a power supply can fail in many, many ways. It is just not just fails to mm -hmm. see. No, no, but we will explain this. I have prepared a few slides. I also will um, open a few of these uh, Pandora box items around the power supply that some people do not consider really. And that is why we have this webinar to talk about this. So, uh, okay, so uh, let me end. Uh, yes, the, the, you can close that. Close it. Let me show you the result. We have a very mixed result. So, yeah, that's good. Know. That means there's a lot of confusing still. <laughs> So the first one was picked here is the A, is a reliability issue for that safety instrument function. That is, of course, also correct, but it's not the most complete answer. There is another reason also, besides the reliability, the second topic that some people clicked was, it is also a availability issue. Although we say 
it's a de-energized to trip. You cannot think about already about the availability of that power supply, or let's say the power itself to some instruments is also relevant for some safety functions. So it can be also an availability issue, which we will explain later on, because there are two different types of availability in terms of de-energized to trip or energized to activate. There are two different concepts. And the correct answer that we believe that we should discuss with you is can be both a reliability issue and an availability issue. Because as Paolo was saying, a power supply or a power converter can actually fail in many different ways. You can have overcurrent, you can have over voltage, you can have under voltage, you can have an accuracy problem. So all of these items will be discussed because end of the day, some of your elements could, for instance, your instrumentation could be damaged because of an over voltage, or some of your instruments will need some power for a certain period in able to go to a process safe state. You cannot imagine you turn off the light and your entire plant will be safe. You have to do it in a certain sequence. You need to have a certain sequence also of your shutdown. Those are all kind of the items why we need to have a power supply that we can trust, that is both unavailable and also reliable in terms of it will be not damaging your instrumentation. I will... Uh, well, it was the majority of the answer was the correct answer, so... The majority was here, the correct answer was C, can be both a reliability and availability, and I will try to highlight this later on here in the slides. Right, let's first talk about normal conditions. There is no fault. Everything is working perfectly. <laughs> Every single subsystem is failure free and is working as per requirements. Then your subsystems or your interfaces, as you can see here on the right top uh, corner uh, on this SIF or the safety instrument function loop from left to right, that means the subsystems needs to have a reliable power supply or power feed. That means it needs to be accurate typically between one to 2% range, I would say is the accuracy of the power supply or even better. Under voltage is a very big topic that we need to make sure that the necessary voltage is there to operate because if you would have an under voltage, maybe some of your elements will not function correctly anymore. Same with an over voltage, an over voltage, actually under voltage and over voltage are typically items. If we would run here a 61508 a training course for hardware developers. Well, the hardware developers on a power supply will need to know that under voltage and over voltage is a diagnostic requirement in the 61508 part two, which is the hardware section. Another item which we haven't uh, discussed yet, the diagnostics will also protect your power supply against the latch up or the high in rush currents and also against the overcurrent. So you can say, yeah, we have a fuse and the, and, the, and, and the fuse will blow when we have an overcurrent. Well, some fuses may not be fast enough. And I know from an incident from the industry that there was a offshore platform being damaged on the final elements because of an over rush current that actually damaged the instruments without the fusing knowing there was a, a problem in the field. So those are the kind of items in a nutshell, that we will try to put under the diagnostics capability of some power supplies, like, for instance, the SIL rated power supplies that GMI is providing. And they are SIL in comparison to a normal power supply because they take care of all these diagnostic features and they can actually feed you back this information. Availability. Availability has been around the corner for all these years that I've been in the process industry because availability is always one of the first items that power supplies will look at. For instance, you will have uh, redundancy, you may have model redundancy, like in the 19 inch rack, you may have some low sharing over diet bridge and all that. That is all to do with the availability of the power itself. But the reliability that makes it that classified SIL compliant power supply is actually the first bullet here in the subsystems that I was just explaining you in light of the 6508 part two. Again, there is a specific um, webinar from GMI that you will find also on the YouTube channel. And I'm sure in the future it will be run again, why a standard power supply can be used in a safety instrumented function. The last bullet here on my slide, it goes without saying, not only the power supply, we also need to rely on a quality instrument air. If your instrument air is have not the quality 
to maintain the systems in a good working conditions. For instance, if it would be, uh, there would be some moisture in your instrument there, or there would be some dirt in your instrument there, well, then some of your instrumentation will not function as required. So also that needs to be looked at. Now we're gonna, now we have the power supply. We have now the, the uh, clean instrument there for our instruments. Now let's just discuss how a safety function will function. So once the sensor is measuring the signal and is actually recognizing it goes into a trip condition, that means that your logic solver will have to provide the right signal to the field. And if it is a de-energized to trip, the principle of your distal outputs will typically be using a normally open contact. That means we're going to remove the power to the field and able to go to a safe position. So once we are removing the distal output channel and it goes over an interposing relay, that means that the interposing relay will have to take over that function. And that's where it sometimes becomes very, let's say, uh, tricky for some engineers because some of the projects that you may have worked on may reverse that functionality because there are uh, safety relays uh, from uh, from GMI that can work direct. There are also safety relays that can work in, uh, inverse. That means it can just go from normally open to normally con normally close contacts. And those are the kind of items that you will have to look at in terms of either your de-energized to trip or your energized to activate. Suppose that your normally open contact on your safety relay is also removing the power to the field. That means that then finally your solenoid will actually cut the instrument there. And if it was a, a spring return actuator for a fail to close valve, that means that once you remove the instrument there, providing the vent is not blocked and the instrument there can actually be vent from your um, actuator, then the spring will actually close the valve into a safe position. That's the normal condition if everything is working properly. As I said, the digital output module from safety PLC vendors sometimes cannot interface the, let's say, voltage slash current requirements of your Find elements or of your solenoids. That is why we are working mainly there through interposing relays. And there's a lot to do with an interposing relay because you can think, well, a relay is only a stupid thing with a coil and a contact. Well, actually, there's a lot more that is building into those relays to make sure they will not unnecessarily spare your strip. Because if you use a single contact and the relay for some reason would have a mechanical failure and the spring would not be able to keep the contact closed and the contact would go open for no reason, you would trip your plant. And I'm pretty sure your production people would not be so happy if they lose actually unnecessarily the production. Now, if you look here on the picture of a specific relay from GMI, which is here the model number shown, you can see here we have here on the top Okay, I think you can see my cursor moving. We have here two normally open contacts here on the top, and we have two normally contacts here on the bottom. So actually, there are two contacts. Both of them have to go open, and both of them have to go open here. So this is a two out of two contact. That's another two out of two contact. But the way the system or the safety relay has been designed means that either one of those two will have to go open to remove the load of this single solenoid. The reason why this is here in a hardware fault tolerance configured like it is today is, first of all, the two out of two is there for not creating a spurious trip. That is one. And the second one, we have a one out of two in terms of availability that if one doesn't work, the other one can still remove the power. That is the way that this relays have been uh, built by GMI. As I said, it's not just like in the good old days when I was 35 years ago running in, a, in the field and I'm putting an interposing relay into a, a marshalling cabinet. It was just a normal interposing relay. There was nothing fancy on it. It was just in out. But now if you look on the, on the uh, uh, classical smart relays, as we call them, well, the smart interposing relay, there is a lot more in the background than just opening and closing a contact. The diagnostic features will look at things like, for instance, the current, we'll look at the, at the load, 
we look at the short circuit, we look at the earthing problems, all this can be diagnosed inside this one small relay and this information can be fed back to your um, to your control systems i know that gmi has some oem agreements with most of all those uh, let's say system providers and you can provide this uh, feedback from the diagnostics back into your system so basically you will be alerted if in the field something would go wrong that is here the picture and I'm sure that there's also a webinar on the relays itself that can give you some more information. I'm just using this here to tell you it's not just a contact. There's a lot more in the background with the smart interposing relays based on diagnostics. I've done this webinar before. I've been giving them this information here with this two out of two relays which I showed you here the context of this two out of two on the top and the two out of two here on the bottom. Now you can say in normal condition, in a de-energized to trip means normal condition, there is no reason to trip. That means we need to keep the power to this solenoid. But assuming that you're switching off the solenoid and there would be an earth leakage or there would be an end of line line monitoring, even when it is de-energized, the smart relays from GMI can still monitor the load of the line, which is typically only used in energized to activate. But diagnostics here can also be based on the line monitoring for a de-energized to trip functionality. And that is here the picture which you see load on on the left and here load off on the uh, right hand side. I'm sure that the specialists from GMI in their webinars will go a lot more in detail that I'm doing here. I'm just using their examples to show you the two differences in a de-energized to trip application. If you remove the power, even then the diagnostics on a smart diagnostic relay is still playing a role. If you move from the interposing relay, I will now go into the single solenoid is the second last one. Um, and I have to move this window because this window is just on my picture. So you see here, I highlighted here the solenoid. The solenoid can be one single solenoid. And if you look in your current installation, I would not be surprised that your solenoid and your final element is a single device. That means a one out of one device. And I would also not be surprised if you look on the left-hand side to your sensors, that is where very easily and classically you will go to a one out of two voting or even to a two out of three voting. That means assuming that you have a two out of three voting structure on your sensors, they will go through three different barriers. They will go into three different inputs of your logic solver. Your logic solver may even have redundant IO modules. That means that you will transfer those three signals from those three transmitters into your input in your logic solver, then in your interlock solver, you will have a two out of three voting block. And classically that two out of three voting block will be channeled to one output channel. And this one output channel may then go into one interposing relay because you're only having one single solenoid in the field. And then you have one single final element. Based on statistical records from the industry, more than 50%, so half of the problems are always the two final subsystems here in my picture, meaning your uh, solenoid and at, at least your final element, meaning your fail to close or fail open valve. And what I've done here on this uh, picture, I took here on the courtesy of the company called Safeplex, which was a... Uh, a ex-colleague from in the older days from me when I was working with a specific vendor. His company was providing for a one of the largest chemical plants in uh, Asia. He was providing here this, uh, call it a uh, stainless steel, I call it a junction box, it's actually more than a junction box. Inside, he has here two manifolds, as you can recognize here, maybe on this picture. And on top of this manifold, you can see that there are two solenoids on the left-hand side. There are two solenoids on the right-hand side. There are four pressure measurements. And those four pressure measurements and those four solenoids are actually configured with a PLC doing block and bleed continuously. There are two different air pads in here. And he is replacing with this, you could call it sophisticated box, 
he's replacing this one solenoid because this large chemical plant in Asia, they realized if they're using one single solenoid, well, that one single solenoid may be two times a problem. One, it can be a problem towards superior strip. Other side, it may be a problem towards safety that will not move when you need it. So what they did was they installed this box. It's continuously like a block and bleed, if you can call it like this. It is configured in a two out of four, the D stands for diagnostic based on the program run here in that uh, PLC. And this is a, a solution that I just want to highlight to you. It's not just one single solenoid that you can use. You can think about a solution that even if this one single solenoid would fail, you can still keep and your plant maybe available or also protected that you can go to shutdown if you would need it. Right, oops, that was too quick. Yes. Then, yeah, I was uh, already on the, on the last slide, sorry, Paolo. So then the final element itself, this is classically where people will struggle, not only in trying to prove how available it is or how reliable it is, because they are only allowed to typically buy one single valve because those subsystems here at the end can be in some safety loops, the most expensive subsystem on your entire loop. That means that very often the, let's say management will push the engineers to say, let's stick with one valve and make sure the valve will move when we need it. People will then come up with some, uh, let's say creativity and they will say, let's put a partial stroke on it. While partial stroke cannot be used to make this valve more safer, partial stroke can only be used to delay the full stroke in terms of your proof test. That's another topic that we are discussing also in other webinars. Let's stay on this uh, final valve. Now, the final element can be, for instance, three different vendors. You may buy your smart positioner from vendor A, you may buy your actuator from vendor B, and you may buy, example, your ball valve from vendor C. Now, who will take the entire responsibility if you assemble those three vendors into one solution? It's clear that the smart positioner that may have a sales paper called certificate will say, well, our smart positioner has an integrity equal to compliance to SIL X. Maybe your actuator vendor will do that, but maybe the ball vendor may have nothing. So how can you come up then with a certain integrity of the entire solution that is where in the future, and we are still waiting, there will be a new functional safety standard coming out, which is here referred, it will be a Synelec. It's from the technical committee 69 work group number one. And the standard reference is called the N1456 or 1456. I know that the uh, project manager is uh, based out of Germany. My latest news uh, have not been updated now in the last, uh, I think, six months nearly. But the latest news that it, uh, it, they are still working on the on the draft of the document. So to my know-how, it has not been released yet. But once we have it, or once we would have the standard available, it will give you a, a method structure on how to predict the availability per subsystem because now today what people will do is since we have no other film safety standard available they will use the roots of the 61508 and they will try to predict how available some of those subsystems can be okay paulo i got a another poll question coming up okay i'm ready oops why and i'm not now nah, because i am uh, i was uh Opening. I don't know why I cannot launch it. It's not coming up. No, I can do it. Maybe here, Paulo. Um, I should... Because I was typing an answer to a question, but uh, I don't know why this. Uh, mm, the room. Close it to start again. Okay, I got it here. Oh, well, maybe you blocked me. I cannot launch it. It says. And can you? The button is blocked. <laughs> can you launch it now? Because I cannot launch it. Also, mine mine is grayed out. Maybe they I, didn't I don't know. Right. There's some problem with this. Uh, Okay. This, um... Let me see. Let me let me try one more time. Stop sharing. I stop sharing this, and I close no, it. I can try to open the. Can you now now open the poll on the bottom bar of the Zoom meeting? 
I can see it, but I cannot launch okay. it. Okay, it's, it's on. There no, it is. It's on. Okay, good, okay. good job. No problem. Sorry, guys. You know, okay. technologies always bring some issues. <laughs> <laughs> so, other concept. Well, you already answered. I guess you'll be reading what we've been playing around. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. People, people are quicker than, than us, Paolo, now. So, which other concept can be still suitable compatible under IC61 and 511? The address to trip and address to activate both or none? Hmm. Well, again, yeah, we have a very mixed uh, reply. That's yeah. Interesting. Uh, Good. So that uh, we run this webinar for the very part to share knowledge, you know, so that you guys can learn more and uh, we like that and if there are conflicting answers that's good because it means you know yeah somebody will learn something okay i think you can share the result you can yeah. enter all powers Let me end it and share the results so again you have a very mix we have uh, 15 16 percent said de-energized to tip a few of us says energized to activate and the majority 76 percent said both and it's the majority that wins the uh, wins the vote here because um, there is a there is somehow a concept or let's say an understanding a misunderstanding in the market and that is because of the IEC SIG fifteen eleven edition one and the title today is still called safety instrumented system which is supposed to be a prevention protection layer and the prevention protection layer is classically always built in a DNSIS to trip. And if you look into your, let's say, LOPA structure, classically, the mitigation layers are actually not part of the prevention. That means they are in the mitigation layer. And a fire and gas application, classically, in the older days, was not considered under the umbrella of the 6.15.11. However, edition number two of the standard 6.15.11 has a technical report out since February 2020, so it's now three years and in that report they state that there is a misconception in the market believing that a mitigation system between brackets they even give the example such as a fire and gas should also be built realable with a minimum sill equal to one so in the technical report and i do know technical reports are not normative they are technical on top of the normative part but they give you the recommendation to think about to build your fire and gas which are the enders to activate system even to build those realable that's also where they are requiring to have a minimum sill one i had some people asking me why do they require from the standard out a sill one and not a sill two well i cannot answer this but what they try to highlight is here that since we are using the same electronics, often the same logic solvers, it's also good to think about to have a reliable loop in terms of your fire and gas. And I fully agree with some of the comments that I got earlier saying that the uh, sensor itself and the silk concept of a gas, a gas sensor, for instance, well, if your gas sensor has maybe a sill integrity X, but the wind is blowing that day from the other way, and it's blowing the gas away from the gas sensor, that sill X will not do anything for that sensor. So the mapping of your fire and gas sensors is a lot more critical in terms of having that sill X on it or not. So we need to be also clear on that. But once your sensor is capable to actually measure the right concentration of gas, that this may be a problem in the field, well, then we need to make sure it will give the right signals into our installation. So let me continue and we go to the last topic of this webinar, which is NSIS to activate. Now we have to just think the opposite. Where we were trying to remove the power to go to safe position, now we have to turn on the power in able to activate to reach our final, let's say, uh, state, which is here if you would have a fire and gas system, if your fire and gas would be actually detecting or measuring a gas concentration, then it will have to alert the shutdown system to stop the production to not make it worse. And try to isolate maybe if you have a leak on a, a pipeline and you have some gas coming out of the pipeline, well, then you have to isolate the uh, pipeline. There is no more gas building up 
and you could try to mitigate the consequences. That is the whole concept. Equally, when you have a, um, a fire detector and there is fire, well, then the fire will be recognized by the, let the flame eye, and the flame eye will have to initiate that the deluge system can be activated. That means you need to have power available, you need to have water available, et cetera, et cetera, enabled to try to mitigate the consequences of the fire. Now, the power supply, which we mentioned earlier, is now playing a very crucial role because now it not only has to be reliable, also the availability is part of your safety function because without power, you cannot activate your safety loop. That means that the power supply itself for an exercise to activate the availability is actually the key element to reach your safety uh, position of that safety loop. Common examples of an exercise to activate, as already mentioned, fire and gas, deluge systems, fire suppression system, foam system, high voltage protection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Exercise to activate a normal operation, the loop has no power. So that means that when there is no alarm on your fire and gas system, the final elements or the outputs on your system have no power. That means there is an issue here that you need to monitor that line. That is where the word line monitoring is coming into play, that if you have a fire and gas system, you have a normal condition, no power on this line, you will put an end of line resistor, end of the line that is just before you go into your solenoid to measure the, let's say, the current or the resistance of that, of that uh, wire to make sure the wire is still there. Because if you would lose that wire, someone would cut the wire, you cannot activate your output anymore. Opposite, when a de-energized to trip solution, there's always power on that line. If someone will cut it, you lose the power and you go to shutdown. That's not the case if you have an exercise to activate. That is why things like this diagnostics, which I mentioned before, of the smart relays from ZMI that is monitoring the open or short circuit, the loop resistance, the leaking, the earthing, etc., becomes a very vital role with an exercise to activate application. But the question would be, if you look in your control logic solvers and you mix both de-energized to trip and energized to activate into one logic solver, how do you turn on the power in a broken digital output module enabled to power up your output to maybe start your deluge system? Those are kind of items that you need to think of. Is this possible that I may use maybe my de-energized to trip I use one of these inverse smart relays from ZMI, which I do have a picture coming up in the next coming slides. That means that you will use all your logic solver in the same concept, de exercise but you will actually reverse the signals with your interposing relay. That is potentially a solution to think of. Safety PLCs itself, that's another point. If you are using your digital output modules, which are also um, exercise to activate. Some vendors will provide you both modules, normal digital output module for the exercise to trip and the line monitoring output modules for the exercise to activate. But assume that if the exercise to activate would go over a interposing relay and you, you, you're taking an interposing relay which doesn't have the diagnostic capabilities, you're losing that functionality of your PLC vendor. That is why the line monitoring that can be in a smart relay from GMI can actually take over that role to show the transparency of that loop all the way to your final element. And that diagnostic feature can actually be fed back in your safety PLC. So the line monitoring, I already explained that, so I will skip that. The smart relays, that is where I'm looking now for the picture. And here it is. So there are two ways of using a interposing relay. Either, simply speaking, you go from normally open contact in to normally open contact out. That's the direct relay, which is the one shown over here. So load in, load out. Or you go to the second one, which is just the opposite. You go through a normally open contact in to a normally closed contact out. So that is where you will make from a, if you would see here on the right-hand side, if you would power this with a normal de to trip digital output module, 
your relay can make it an energized to activate again here on the other side. That is how you can mix those two concepts with one principle, uh, with one digital output module from your safety PLC vendor, but then you will use two different types of relays to make the switch in the field to go to a exercise to activate. Conclusion, and looking at my time, I'm, I was trying to keep it around 45 minutes, so I'm almost there, Paulo. What is my conclusion that I want you to take away from this webinar is that the de to trip is the only fail-safe solution. Meaning that if you think that exercise to activate is also fail-safe, that's not possible. Because as I was saying before, how will you make it possible to provide power if there is maybe no power available or if your element cannot provide the power anymore? Those are type of items that you have to look at if you would actually have an exercise to activate. It's clear that the exercise to activate, or sorry, a exercise to trip is a lot easier from a design point of view for an engineer to build. Whereas an exercise to activate often needs a bit more engineering skills. And that's where it becomes a little bit tricky if you start to mix those. That is what I want to make clear here in this uh, webinar. And I second last bullet, I hope that we just simply touched a few items on the power supply units to make sure that you think about in the future, if you want to use a reliable power supply, it's not only the availability which is playing a role here. For the energize to activate, the availability is the final thing to look at, but also we need to think about it. What about the availability for my de-energize to trip? And I hope that with the story about the diagnostics on a power supply in terms of the over voltage, the under voltage, the current, etc., that a SIL rated power supply makes sense to protect your safety loops. And the last bullet is, as I was mentioning before, tech report number four from February 2020 is now for the last three years, they are telling the industry, we should also think about building reliable fire and gas systems with a minimum level of a SIL-1, which will mitigate the consequences. We can help you with the services, as Paolo was showing you on the product slide. Besides the interfaces of GMI, we also have some services in terms of training and in terms of consultancy. That is here consultancy on both the life cycle of the 61511, but also on the life cycle of the cybersecurity, which is the 62443, the OT security support. And of course, one of the main tasks that I'm personally still involved in is providing the TOV Rhineland uh, competency review schemes of training programs. So myself, I'm uh, providing the Functional Safety Engineers SIS. Um, the counter is something like 277 trainings that I've been doing over the last 15 years. So we have uh, in the range of 2,700 plus people trained. We also provide, in the meantime, the fundamentals of cybersecurity and the security risk assessment. And the good news is, since end of uh, December 2022, so it's only for the last uh, four to five months now, we are allowed to combine those two trainings into one package in an entire week. So it's four days training, and there are exams on the last day on the Friday. We do still provide customized in-house uh, training and also seminars. And of course, I've been told that GMI is still providing uh, in the future with webinars. So we are still uh, sharing some know-how to the industry. Another thing that I would like to highlight is here this, uh, I call it the famous yellow book. I've been just giving out another, I think, 40 books uh, in the last two uh, training, Paolo. So my stock is getting low again, so I will need to order some new books. But um, that, that book is in the fourth edition. And if you would go into chapter seven and chapter eight, chapter seven is something that I wrote myself, which is the summary of the SIG 1511, but chapter eight is the safety requirement specification. It's a book that you can uh, request free of charge. There is a uh, web link that you can find on the GMI webpage. Of course, if you would order many books, there will be a shipping cost, but the book itself, I've been told, is still free of charge. And correct me if I'm wrong, Paolo. No, no, you're right. 
that is still one of Swap the best on to gmscanation.com and you'll find the link to how to order the book okay and i think i'm finished i will close this paulo and i will um, stop sharing and i will do i share the q a or do you share that it's i can do it ready. all right here we are You're sorry fine. Finally, yeah. Right. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, um, so. So, I'll, I'll, uh, these are the questions you guys post through the registration. We go through them, and then we also go through the one you're asking live. Okay, correct. So, you go next. So, uh, are there a software difference for DTA or ETA application? Okay, so the question is really to do with, is there any difference between the hardware and the software between a de-energized to trip because the, the person has typed DTA, but I would assume it's de-energized to trip that that person or engineer was asking versus ETA application. Well, I think we have handled that, but just to make sure that we, we summarize this here in this answer again, hardware differences, example for a PLC, normally de-energized will be with a normally open contact digital output module. Whereas for an energized to activate will be typically uh, a line monitoring digital output module that some vendors can provide. As I said, some vendors cannot provide that. They only provide you one type of module, which is a digital output module with a normally open contact. And that is where you're using the smart relays from uh, GMI to invert that signal into a NSIS to activate. Sometimes engineers prefer to use all the same modules. It's easier maybe sometimes for spare parts, etc., And they will swap the application by the smart relay, which I just explained you. From a software point of view, and I'm talking about software in terms of application programming of the safety PLC itself, the software difference itself, for a programming point of view, um, we typically call the de-energized to trip the zero logic. And often the same is also used for ESD. As I said, we will use the same interlock, the same logic solver. We're going to use the same function blocks, and we may reverse that channel later on with that interpose relay. However, there are specific fire and gas uh, systems on the market. I have seen one many years ago, and that fire and gas system was using a one logic. It's still the same kind of, let's say, logic solving they are doing, but they are solving the logic just the opposite as you used to do for the SIS or for your de-energized to trip. They are just solving it all into a one logic. I hope with this, this uh, question is answered. So what, I think so, a little complex, but you know, we will get a copy of this slide so you guys can read it more carefully. And the difference between mitigate and protective system. Okay. I think you talked about this a little bit during yeah. Yeah, it's actually yeah. something I'm learning as well. Yeah. So mitigation, I mean, the question is, is there a difference between the mitigation protection layers and a difference between the protection layers, which are typically, I mean, we, we call everything protection layers. But if you look into your LOPA layer of protection analysis, everything we can prevent is to the final, let's say, isolating layer, which is typically your SIS layer. Anything above is called the mitigation layers. So my first bullet, mitigation, is typically reducing the consequences, and typically only the consequences. There are some exceptions that the mitigation layer can sometimes also reduce some of the frequencies, but mainly it's only the consequences. Classically would be, for instance, um, we are reducing the consequences because the hazard is already happening. We couldn't stop it. We couldn't isolate it. Like when you have relief valve going open, that means your high pressure trip point didn't work because the pressure was pressure was building up still more than the trip uh, let's say level relief valve goes open that means you try to relieve the uh, let's say the high pressure of that unit a flare system when you have a flare system on a production unit which is flaring some of the product that means Either there is a production problem, maybe some quality issue with the production itself, or maybe one of the units has tripped and they have to get uh, rid with some of the production and they will flare it into that uh, mitigation system. But the flare system can also fail. That means that you have to look into the, let's say, the reliability of your flare system. A burst plate same system or the same principle as with a relief valve, a sprinkler system. That means that if you detect there is some fire in your plant and you have to start your um, 
sprinkler system, that means I had to reduce the consequence of the fire. And then we have a bound or a dike, which means the, let's say the wall around your tank form, that if you have a leak in your tank, it will mitigate, et cetera, et cetera. So all of them are all classical mitigation systems. Protective systems are, if I look on protection system on the prevention, anything we try to prevent. So we look at the, let's say, the normal process design. We will try to use inherently safe design techniques. Then we're going to put some process control layers on that. That means we're going to put like a, a BPCS or a DCS system on it. So we're going to try to control the process, measuring the process value. We're having the set point. We are controlling our outputs. And if this starts to go wrong, we hope that our safety loop, which is your safety instrumented system, will actually measure your, let's say, trip point, and it will actually be able to isolate the hazard from escalating that you will have to start to mitigate it. So the last layer in your prevention protecting system is also uh, called your emergency shutdown system, or that's classically known as your SIS, or safety instrumented system. We try to isolate that the hazard will start to escalate and go into the mitigation conditions. Right, Paolo. Okay. Can the occurrence of a general fault within fire and gas detection panel be classified as an alarm? Yeah, I, I was uh, struggling with this question. So <laughs> I thought, okay, I better read it a few times and I will try to answer it to my best uh, capabilities. Well, it clearly, it all depends what does this engineer uh, consider or the system vendor consider as a general fault, because I found this a bit of a odd name in a safety business. I mean, a general fault, of course, it depends if the general fault would be something, let's say, giving the transparency of the health condition of your safety system. In other words, if it would be a diagnostic based alarm alerting the engineer or the operator that there is a healthy condition problem of that fire and gas system or sensor, well, then certainly this should be defined or will be defined or would be defined as a critical alarm because your architecture may suffer from this fault in your system. Yeah. Providing a general fault is not affecting the functionality, well, then my advice would be it should not have been considered as an alarm in the first place as it is not critical to my functionality. But again, it's a very, very, let's say, generic question. You can answer multiple answers. I was trying to think about if it is critical, well, then, yes, it has to be an alarm. If it's not critical, the question is, why would it be then called an alarm if it's not critical for us? But again, you, you can... You don't want too many alarms, you know, because otherwise... You can debate this for hours, I think. It will not but be... Suppose you lose a wire, you know, going to one of those deluge valves, you know. But then it would be a critical it's functionality a critical. of the functionality of the safety system that needs to be alerted. That's an alarm. So then it would be an alarm. Yeah. All right. And then, sorry. We have one more. One more, I think. What, how to deal with this concept when we have same controller, ESD, and parent gas? Yeah. The two configurations are there, the energized and, and energized to treat at, in the same system, I guess, right? Yeah, okay. So the same controller using use both for ESD and fire and gas. Yeah, actually, this was already discussed in the webinar, but I, I want to repeat this again because I recognize the name of the engineer who asked me that. So uh, welcome back. So this was um, <clears throat> answered before. However, there is no problem in a technical sense to mixing de-energized to trip functionality with an energized to activate in the same, if you call it the PLC vendor, okay? As long as your final elements, or let's say your digital output modules will distinguish between the de-energized to trip, clearly using the normally open contacts, removing the power to trip, whereas the other one will be the line monitoring modules. They may be sitting in the same rack, and the line monitoring modules will have no power in normal conditions. And there you have to energize to activate your final elements. But as I said before, some end users or some, let's say, maintenance uh, people are finding this a mess configuration to have it in the same box. And they like to use all the normal open contacts, the normal digital output modules, and then they are obliged 
to inverse the signal with that smart uh, relay like I was showing you from GMI. However, there are vendors on safety PLC that will provide you with both potentials. That means then you don't have to inverse with a smart uh, relay. You, you will do it in, in the same controller. And there is, I cannot see any issue to do it other than, other than if there is a modification necessary in that system, assume that, and I'm now talking in, in terms of the safety PLC vendors here, assume that you have a large safety PLC and you put your fire and gas system application in the same box as your ESD and you have a modification request in your ESD section. Can your fire and gas system be still active, still being alive, if you have to take your shutdown system offline to do some large modification, that's a question that I would ask in terms of availability for those two different applications. But if you say, look, we don't need any fire and gas system alert during the modification on our ESD, that's possible. Well, then you can maybe put it all in the same box. But I'm, a, I'm an, I'm an old-fashioned engineer, I think. I, well, I am certainly old. I may be old-fashioned old now. But if you put all your eggs into one basket and you're losing the bottom of this basket, well, then I think you have the answer already. You will not eat any omelette in, in the morning if your basket is actually losing all the eggs. In other words, I like to have them separate. It's a lot cleaner for maintenance, for maintaining it, for describing it, for documentation. But there is nothing against to say, put it all in one box and be a happy family. I hope I, I was very neutral in my answer, Paolo. Yeah, that's very clear. All right. Before we go, okay, here we talk about the, our life, but we do have an answer. I answer most questions, you know, okay, I can't answer them. Look at the question. I could handle them, but there's one for you, and I want you All to right. answer life. Okay. It says, what is the benefit to have load monitoring for denergized to trip relay? If power is removed, it will trip. It'd be too late to make action. Correct. However, there may be a you may be in a shutdown on that one safety loop, but assume that you have maybe an earth problem on that safety loop. Mm -hmm. You may not be able to find this without any diagnostics. That means that if you have such a smart relay, and although you are in a de-energized to trip condition and you have trip, you remove the power, the relay will still monitor that line to still tell you the conditions of that final, let's say, line uh, end of line resistor at the end of the line to prove that there is not a problem in the field wiring. And that is the only thing benefit that you can have from a diagnostics in a de uh condition. When the power is gone, you still monitor the line. This is not possible with norm relays. Norm relay, mm -hmm. they just remove the power no matter what. Let me, let me, add, uh, let me add a little point. Honestly, you know, majority of uh, the application when you use a line monitor relay are for uh, energized to trip, you know. Correct. Energized energized to activate. To activate. Yeah. For example, we have an application where we have um, a dual head valve with the valve with two open and close, and with which is, you know, a de energized to trip, but you're able to read the impedance of this valve throughout the line, and you can see if one of the two is failing without actually failing the complete loop, or you, because you can read this value, or you can read the resistance and see if this resistance value is changing in time, meaning that you might have to replace the, uh, the solenoid. You know, so you're doing some preventive maintenance. So there are other advantages other than just safety, you know, to do for availability, for maintenance purpose, to monitor the line, because you can actually investigate a little bit about your load you know okay great so we have uh, i click here says we have replied to this question <laughs> so we have many live webinars again you can look up our live webinar schedule online and then i believe the next says that we've recorded this webinar and uh, the next slide Bob, uh you know yeah, sorry yeah uh, and well actually there's one last poll so i launch it right you see it Okay. Uh, please give answer to Tino. You know, the, the vote is for Tino, not for myself. I'm just, you know. But you need to give me a good vote oh, no. because, because uh, Paolo is know, paying me. Right. Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just filling in the plate, but the meat is, uh, Tino, I'm just a salad on the, on the side here. Okay, great. Um, guys, thank you. As uh, we said, uh, 
the webinar has been recorded so you will find on our youtube channel and all of you who have registered for it will receive copy of the slides and links out to review and view again the webinar thank you tina for your time thank you for your knowledge thank you thank you paulo thank you for Here everyone is, uh, let me show you the result yeah not excellent and good so thank you guys thank you for being with us today we'll see you shall see you some other time all right thank you i will stop sharing and i see you next time next month next month all right see you thank you bye bye ciao, ciao, ciao.